Good morning and welcome to worship at Grace Lutheran Church in Santa Maria. My name is Pastor Jake. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, we love having as many people possible watching our stream from the comfort of your home, maybe your backyard on a beautiful morning. Also, if you are looking for today's worship bulletin, you can go to our website at gracelutheransm.org. And on the right side, you have access to all of the worship folders from the last few weeks. Some like to use them for devotional references, as well as, and most importantly, today's worship folder. You can download that. You can put it directly onto your iPhone or your iPad, or you can print it out and have it in your hand as we worship today. Happy Father's Day to all of the fathers out there. Also recognizing that many of us have had in our lives very influential people who we don't necessarily call dad, uh, but that are just as, if not even more important at very significant times of our lives. So we, we celebrate all of our fathers, guardians, and faithful neighbors, friends, and relatives who have filled the role of guide and mentor in our, in our lives. Our worship will begin this morning with In the Cross of Christ I Glory, hymn number 427. May God bless your worship. Please rise as we begin worship this morning. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But, but if, if we, we confess, confess our, our sins, sins God, God, who is faithful and just, will, will forgive, forgive our sins and, and cleanse us, us from, from all unrighteousness. unrighteousness. In our worship folder, every moment we come to this Having confessed our sins to God, there's this opportunity here to kneel or stand or do whatever is most reverent for you. This is a moment to reflect on what we've just said as a community and to prepare to hear God's forgiveness. We take a moment of silence. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please continue to stand with us as we read together Psalm 56. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, because your abiding presence always goes with us, keep us aware of your daily mercies, that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear from the scriptures. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah. O oh Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind. Let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of the evildoers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's read Psalm 91 together. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look in with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. The epistle reading is from Romans 6. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God for those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourself 
to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be to God. If you aren't already standing, please rise with us. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter, and this is our third week and third translation reading what we call the Great Commission. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this, day after day, right up to the end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. Our worship continues with If Thou But Trust in God to Guide Thee, hymn number 750.
Good morning again and welcome if you've just started streaming with us this morning. This is our third week discussing the Great Commission, Matthew 28, and I hope that the last couple weeks you've learned something new or found a new insight about yourself, the God that we serve, forgiveness, the church, that something has been able to stick with you. Today, our translation comes from a unique version of the Bible that I keep on hand and have kept on hand till it, till it, uh, since the time it came out, the message by Eugene Peterson, and it's a little off-handed at times, and it comes across kind of bold-faced, but at the very least, it's a new way of reading the scripture when we're used to the same translation year after year after year, whether it's you're still a King James person or you've moved on to NIV or maybe even more modern, the ESV, which is what we use frequently from Sunday to Sunday. I'm going to read it again. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you, go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this, day after day after day, right up to the end of the age. Why the Great Commission? The answer to that is one word, forgetfulness. That's why we need to keep hearing what the summary of our belief is. Last week, what's not in the Great Commission? To hear that word teach as the word confirm, to go out and remind people that they belong to God, to confirm the work of God in them, even when possibly you or they don't even see it in themselves, to confirm that God is still active and present in the world over and over and over and over, and that creates hope, and that is attractive to us, to all people. Now, what's in the Great Commission? That's a little harder to answer. I'm going to do my best to give more guiding principles. Because the Great Commission is a big thing. It's a big umbrella under which we exercise our Christian faith. This is where we get down to how you do it versus the way I do it. How the Lutherans do it versus the way the Baptists do it. In fact, one of my new neighbors reminded me of that this last week. He walked up to me and he shook my hand and he said, I've already forgotten his name. I'll have to go back and relearn that. And when he found out I was a Lutheran, he said, well, I'm a Baptist. And he said, you know the difference between a Lutheran and a Baptist? He said, the Lutherans pray quietly and drink loudly, and the Baptists pray loudly and drink quietly. I said, oh yeah, that's true. That's very true. You can see my behavior. That's right. When I act out, when I act in society and in culture, when I'm just myself hanging out on the front porch of my house, you can see me. I'm not invisible. And even though salvation coming through God's word and through baptism has this very quiet, invisible quality because it's the invisible spirit working faith inside of us, the rest of what we do is not in secret. You aren't anonymous on social media. You aren't anonymous, even if you just go from home to work and back again, or even now, even though we're all working at home, many of us, people still see me. The Great Commission includes all that God does in secret and everything that I do very much not in secret with the eyes of the world watching me. So what is it that we're being taught? It's kind of where the rubber hits the road. God is taking care of the salvation, the making us a part of his family part. We have nothing to do with that. It's done, it's sealed, it's confirmed, it's locked in the tomb that's resurrected from the tomb, it's ascended to heaven, God has secured our salvation in Christ through his word and through the sacraments, but then there's all that other stuff. 
What's in the Great Commission? Well, number one, there's authority. Now hear me on this, Lutheran Church. You have been given the authority to speak not just about the gospel, but about society. You have been given the right to be human, which means you have the right to speak on behalf of those who are like you, which is the entire human race. We have a call through the Great Commission, through the authority that God has given us, not just to talk about Jesus and salvation and to constantly call the world back to that, but to call the world back to a right and loving relationship with one another. And if we don't do that, we sacrifice the Great Commission because who will listen to us about this invisible God in the sky if we don't love the very visible neighbor next to us? You have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The Great Commission calls you to be as much a part of heaven through the sacraments as much as a part of earth through society and culture. God's authority to act in ways that lead others to a right relationship with him and a right relationship with one another. I'm going to share one bit of fatherly advice on this Father's Day Sunday that I got from my dad. If my brothers are listening, I apologize. I'm sure he didn't say it like this, but after, you know, decades of hearing your dad's voice in your head, you kind of forget exactly what the words are, but here's how I've summarized it, at least today. My dad told me, be willing to do the job no one else is willing or wants to do, and you'll always have a job. My dad was a gardener, worked for the city, the county, worked with a lot of plants, dug a lot of ditches. Both my parents, ultra green thumbs, they can make dead sticks grow out of nothing. He was in the dirt a lot, he was in the sun a lot, his skin showed that wear. I don't always take his advice, but there are key moments in my life that I have taken his advice, and it's interesting to me because each of those times I chose to do the thing that other people didn't want to do, it turned out to be a colossal act of compassion that even I underestimated. What is it about dirty jobs that are implicit with compassion? Maybe it's just that other people don't want to do them because they're dirty. Maybe it's because a dirty job is usually hard work. Maybe it's because a dirty job is just never going to be quite as cool as being a hedge fund manager or some other lucrative business that we all think about. Or maybe a dirty job is really just the moment in all of our jobs when we say, you know what, somebody needs to do that and I'm going to go do it. Being reconciled to God, I mean, being made right with God in spite of and because of our sin. In some ways, that was the easy part because Jesus did it all for us. He took, he took the burden away from us. He took the hard, dirty job away from us and he just does it. And then he gives us all the credit for it. That's kind of the easy part. The hard part is that horizontal, making things and keeping things right between you and me. Talk about a dirty job. A job that people don't want to do. How complicated is that? Jesus, he makes salvation super simple. He says, here's your problem. Here's my solution. Here's the bridge. Guess what? I already found somebody to walk across it. And then once they get to the, the right side of the bridge to give you the credit for walking across it. And Jesus just keeps saving us and he keeps forgiving us and he keeps absolving us. He's just like, I'm going to do it whether you want me to and even though you don't understand. But me being reconciled to you and you to your neighbors, to your family, to your society, to your boss, to your job, whatever it is, all of those levels of relationship that are broken, that is hard and the church will always have a job. And that job of reconciliation, of trying to make 
friends where there isn't a friendship, there's always going to be an act of compassion. And for that reason, a part of the Great Commission, God pulls us together in this family of people who are constantly pushing one another away. The Great Commission is heaven and earth. And finally, God's authority to act in ways that bring people together for how long? Day after day until we cannot do it any longer. Until we're called out of this war. Three scriptures guide me. And I say guide very lightly because the solutions that I come up with to carry out the Great Commission in my home, in my city, on my block, with my neighbors, are not the same as anybody else, any other Christian. You actually have to find those solutions according to the scriptures and by the leading of the Spirit on your own. You have to think about it and you have to practice it and put it into play. The Great Commission that you have has a unique flavor, has a unique tone, and it has unique issues that you have to address in your context. Mine is different, but these are the ones that, these are three passages that bring me back to the Great Commission and the need to deal with this horizontal plane while celebrating the vertical salvation that I have in God, and that's security. When I'm dealing with the insecurity of the world, I can always fall back on the security of Christ. So the first one is Proverbs 3.27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it's in your power to act. Very simple and so hard. Because I would love to not do all of the dirty jobs that show up every day. And it's those little moments when I have the opportunity to infuse a situation with compassion, with mercy and love and forgiveness, with the grace of God, with absolution. And instead, I turn to condemnation and judgment. And just because it might seem justified and warranted, even though I might assess a relationship in my life that I am justifiably offended by doesn't mean that I'm doing the hard work. The hard work comes when I choose absolution, when I choose to remove the burden of guilt, whether from me or someone else. That's the hard job. Diagnosing who's right or wrong is easy. But choosing to give love, to not withhold good, if it's in my power to do so, that's hard. The second one comes from the first chapter of James. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, everyone, and maybe you're already starting to play it over in your head, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Why? And I love that the word human is, is put in here because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness God desires. From one day to the next, I will completely disagree with this because sometimes I feel like my anger is the motivation to bring about right and justice. It's the fuel in the fires of change. My frustration expressed in anger will somehow bring together this group of people who are also angry. And it never does. It never works. It's never worked for me. That anger that fuels me into a conflict with somebody that I am 100% justified to draw the lines in, I still have to choose not to be angry. I still have to choose to put my anger back and to lead with compassion. 
to lead listening and to shut my mouth. And the last one. This comes from the book of Hosea and one day we will do a whole study on the book of Hosea because you want to talk about dirty jobs. Well, I I say the same thing about the book of Jeremiah. Talk about a dirty work kind of prophet. But the book of Hosea is pretty brutal because it paints the prophet Hosea as this abused husband who constantly takes on his wife's unfaithfulness, her lack of loyalty, her her untrustworthiness is constantly being beaten down by the fact that she makes promises and doesn't follow through in some pretty terrible ways. And what Hosea learns by not leading with anger and by choosing to do good to his wife regardless of the fact that she is manipulating him and controlling him, is he comes to understand that this is the same way that God loves us. That regardless of our lack of understanding of everything that he's done for us, he still brings us back into relationship with him. And Hosea says this, In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my idol. For I will remove the names of the idols from her mouth, and they will be remembered by, by, that, by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things of the ground. And here's the key part. On that day when God brings us back into relationship, on that day when Hosea and his wife are united in faithfulness, I will abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety, and I will make you mine in faithfulness, and you will know me. The Great Commission is a pathway to peace. And it starts with the work of Christ and it transcends all of society so that there's no more war between us physically, between our biology and the things that come inside of us, the disease, the ideals that fight us and that push us to be so mad at one another. The Great Commission is not just come to church and hear about Jesus and everything's going to be great. It's the reality that God invades humanity to make a right relationship first between us and him and then us together. And I don't know what your circumstances are or what your dirty jobs are or what the things are in your life and the relationships that you have that are so hard and yet you're so justified to retain that anger and not listening and not seeking peace, but I have them too. And maybe together as the church, called by God and in his authority alone, we can put down our weapons and be God's people. I know every pastor says this at the end of a sermon, but I do hope that the Spirit of God opens your ears and your eyes to know what it is God is calling you to through His Word to make peace with your neighbors. Amen.
please rise as we confess together our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Today's prayers, each will be concluded with, Lord, in your mercy, and the congregation will respond with, hear our prayer. Please join me in prayer. O merciful Father, hear hear your people as they pray in the name of Jesus on behalf of all manner and conditions of people. Faithful God, when we are fearful of our enemies and weary of the struggle, you have been our shield and our strength. Grant to us the full measure of your grace to sustain us against all who are against us and help us to endure the trials and temptations of this mortal life and be faithful unto death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, with your favor upon us, we pray you to help us in our fight against temptation and sin. Help us to live holy and righteous lives by the power of your spirit, and keep us from surrendering ourselves to the slavery from which Christ has set us free. Lord, in your mercy, Faithful God, with the witness of of the saints before us and the courage of your Holy Spirit within us, we pray you to help us to maintain the faithful confession and to contend for the faith in our own age, as did those who confessed Christ at Augsburg. Give to all the churches of the Augsburg Confession unity of doctrine and harmony of life together under the cross of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we remember those who serve us in Jesus' name. Bless the leaders of our synod, all pastors and teachers and all church workers, that they may be faithful in their calling and honor Christ with an obedient life. Raise up those who will follow in their steps and serve your kingdom in the years to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, give grace to those being baptized, to the catechumens in their instruction, and to all the places where people gather to learn your word. Equip equip us to live out the promise of our baptismal life under your grace, and guide us to love our neighbors as you have loved us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Faithful God, give healing and strength to the sick and all afflicted in body and mind, and grant to those who struggle with the gift of peace of mind and heart. Hear us especially for those who have requested our prayers. Today we remember Liz Lepper, Jean Risky, Sue Brum, Charlie Larson, Reverend Gary Hansen, Max Hanneman, Maxine Raymond, the Miranaka family, Nan Lippett, Joan Edwards, Del Kuntz. And those whom we name in our hearts now,
Restore our nation and the world in health and livelihood and preserve us from the pestilence and fear. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Faithful God, give courage to those near life's end and comfort those who mourn. We ask especially today that you would comfort the Woodbury family. We ask also, God, that you would be with Jeffrey and his family and all those who are currently awaiting the last moments of those in their lives who they call family and friends. We also acknowledge today that Father's Day, like Mother's Day, is a day in which we can remember those who have been significant in our lives. We also acknowledge that loss is a very real part of these days. We ask that you would comfort those whose families are broken, whether through sickness, death, or simply through distrust. We ask that you would bring us all together in a way that is glorifying to you and edifying for one another. As we recall the saints who trusted you in life and who died in Christ, encourage us by the witness of your grace and their faith, so that when Christ comes in his glory, we may be found faithful and delivered with them into the glory of your eternal presence. Lord, in your mercy. Faithful God, sanctify us as your people and make us bold to confess you on earth. When this earthly life is ended and we stand before you on high, grant us to hear the Savior's acknowledgement that we are his and he is ours. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things, Father, and everything else for which we need, we pray. We pray you to grant us for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose and lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of those who are sending your tithes, your gifts, and your offerings. We appreciate it. We continue to rely on those funds, not just for the upkeep of the church, but also for the ministries that we have committed to as a church. There are many who are feeling very insecure about their finances, and we appreciate that those of you who are able have been able to continue to send your, your offerings. So please continue to do so continue to make use of the uh, United States Post, sending them to us, as well as using our donate button on uh, the church's homepage at gracelutheransm.org. If you need instruction on how to use that, if you would like to change from a paper to an electronic form of donation, please call or email the church and we're happy to help you with that. Our worship continues at the bottom of page nine. What shall I rent to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house. The Lord be with you. And also with you. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you, and sang. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of heaven, holy, Hosanna in the
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by all availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and in the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us to alone, our Father, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give give us this day our daily bread and and forgive us our trespasses. trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Because we can't take the sacrament together, we'll say this liturgy for an empty table, which is intended to be both acknowledging the difficulty of being separated, but also the reality that our faith in our unity is still solid in Christ. We pray. Holy Father, this table is yours. Our numbers are few. Let not our spirit be led into mourning. For we know that the banquet table in our heavenly home is filled with honored guests. Great comforter, it has been months since we've communed together. Let not our hearts fall into loneliness. For we know that you have sent your spirit to encourage and edify your people. Mighty Redeemer, in this time that we must wait, longing for reunion with one another, let not our minds drift from your promises. For we are forgiven restored and given eternal hope that one day our physical and spiritual loneliness will be made no more. Until that day, loving master, keep your people steadfast in your word, clinging to hope as it is spoken by your son through the gospel and confirmed in our baptism.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As you go about your day and conclude your weekend, go with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Our worship concludes today with hymn number 744, Amazing Grace. Shut